But the Grizzly, of course, Grizzly is the most popular hackle there is. I sold tons of it. And it and the Supreme Court judge in Oregon thought I was selling grizzly bear. And that's really bad. You can't sell grizzly bear. And that's what they charged me for. And I never knew that. So I got a felony. That was Dave McNeese telling a crazy story about how he got busted for acquiring illegal animals for his fly tying. You've got to stick around to hear the full story today on the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. We'll help you on your fly fishing journey with classic stories covering steelhead fishing, fly tying, and much more. Hey, how's it going, everyone? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show today. Dave McNeese, one of the great fly tires and someone who has made a life in the fly fishing business. Dave gives us some insight into the clandestine life of Sig Glasso, breaks down the how-tos of material dyeing, and talks about how he ran a successful fly shop, mail order business, rod building, reel making, and a whole bunch more until he was totally shut down by a fumbled uh, investigation. We're, we're We're gonna get into that. A quick word from our sponsor, godfishing.com is your trusted source for information with access to the world's best fishing trips. You can head over right now to wetflyswing.com slash gotfishing and sign up so you get updated when the next fishing trip is available. Gotfishing.com, the easiest place to start your next fishing adventure. The Fly Fishing and Tying Journal has an exceptional fall edition out right now. Head over to ftjangler.com to support the great work Craig and the gang have created just for you. That's ftjangler.com. Let's just jump into it. Without further ado, here is Dave McNeese. How's it going, Dave? Pretty good. Good. It's good. nice and cool. It's nice and cool day here. Cloudy and cool. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's it's uh it's it's pretty cool. We're we're kind of getting close to mid-August and the great thing about this is these shows is that you know it could be the person listening right now it might be five years from now right in, in December so it's it's kind of a <laughs> it doesn't really matter but for us it does because it's it's August and I'm I'm thinking about steelhead or you know that's on my mind summer steelhead and you you've done some steelhead fishing right over the years oh yeah a lot um, that in fact I've been tying steelhead flies for people going to Canada and, and, and of course they. They, they're not going to go up there this year, but they they'll take the flies because they'll go up next year if it's oh, yeah. open. Mm. That's right, the COVID the COVID thing. So you're still you're still doing some fly tying. Yeah, quite a bit. That's cool. That's cool. What is it about the fly tying? You know, I mean, obviously there there's some money to be made, but why you know after all these years do you continue uh, tying flies? Is it just do you enjoy it that much, or what does it come down to? Well, it's. Um, I've got, I've got these old customers, and unfortunately, um, a couple of them have gone into their 80s, and they can't fish anymore, and they bought um, thousands of flies from me over the years. And, uh, but I still have customers that are, you know, in my age group in the 60s and 70s that are still um, able to fish and experience you know the canadian stuff and they go on guided trips to the disputes at grand ron and and uh elsewhere yeah um a lot of that course is limited this year because of all the closures yep but um that's cool no there is a lot yeah there's obviously a lot uh the covid thing is kind of making it uh a little crazy. I, I wanted to uh, today get into a little bit. You got some big projects going on. One is on um, a book on Sid Glasso, and then you've also got uh, just a bunch. It seems like you have a bunch of things going. I, the material dying is another topic I wanted to dig into. Uh, before we get there, maybe you can just talk about how you first got into fly fishing, and then how you brought that into. I think you you know you've had a fly shop, and how how that all came to be. Well, I started you know going back to my grandfather. He uh, lived in Oklahoma had McNeese's plumbing and heating um, and made a fortune during the oil boom in the 20s. And, and uh, But prior to that, he would come to Oregon to fish. I'm sure he read, um, yep. you know, magazines that 
over exaggerated the catch, but uh, when when was he born? I'm just trying to get a picture of when he would have been reading what what magazines, what era that was. Well, he was born in eighteen. I wonder what eighteen eighties or something like that. And uh, but by the time that he was he was coming to Oregon in the teens, he was probably in his late fifties. And uh, <clears throat> he fished the Rogue and, and the Sayus Line Lake Creek, and eventually he bought property where he liked to fish because he didn't like to have anybody else around him. So he would buy sections of, of the river. And of course, that was back then, the value of land was nothing, and he had uh, plenty of money. Um, and then he taught my father um, his only only child how to fly fish and so my dad was a a really good oarsman um he he i think he was 13 years old when he uh found the um mckinsey uh, boat parade in 1933 hmm. and um, there was a picture of him going through martin rapids at 13 and the boat is completely out of the water and uh, two women in the front of it are screaming. <laughs> is Martin Rapids on the on Mackenzie? On the Mackenzie, yeah. yeah. It's it's the only it's one of the big big rapids. It's a it's several hundred yards long. It's changed course over the years. I think it was a class four, and it may be a class three now. But it's uh, I ran through it last year, and so you get wet. Yeah, and uh, my kids and my kids enjoy that. But hmm. it's just uh, we've got four generations of fly fishing um, people in our family. My kids fly fish, and and uh, I started fishing in 1955. And um, I remember the first trout that I caught on a on a fly that I tied was I think in 1956, and. Uh, I just liked, you know, that we had ponds. Uh, we lived down close to where Odson Stadium is, and there were a couple of couple of ponds there, and we'd go down just as kids and take our worms and go down and catch um, big bluegill, and every once in a while we'd get a nice bass, and I continued to fish pretty much every day. And the McKenzie was just right down the, and hop on the bike, and 10 minutes you were on the McKenzie. <laughs> And, uh, you know, in, in later years, I started, I've always been a, a butterfly collector. And, uh, when I was in my early teens, I started collecting insects, uh, with, um, window screens <clears throat> and would, we kept the screens down on the McKenzie and we'd place them out at different times during the day. And we'd collect the aquatic insects and, and then in the evening, they, the, the um, the adult insects, and then I'd keep them in vials. And uh, at one time, uh, I took them to Oregon State, and then later, I sent them off to Dr. Flint at uh, uh, back back east to examine. And uh, you know, they they uh, so I had a good record of what was what was uh, hatching. And then we did we did sample studies on the trout stomach samples compared to what we were getting in the screen. And that gave me a real good idea. I wasn't a very good fly tire. So it, it gave me an idea of, of how to create something that was uh, the trout we're feeding on. <laughs> and um, later, uh, one of my best experiences was in 1975. Um, I went to the McKinsey Fly Fishers Conclave their 10th anniversary and of course there was you know lee wolf and ernie schwebert showed up and i met steve rachef and there were a lot of people there and i was at the first conclave in 65 hmm. but i was just a you know a teenager and and there weren't a lot of people there but the 75 it was a really good one and it was funny i met uh, steve rachef and i were um, at the bar, and Steve was only I think seventeen years oh, old, wow. but he was a big kid. Of course, the bartender didn't uh, 
she was a family relative and she didn't care. <laughs> Steve got a drink and he was smiling. Yeah. And then Ernie came up uh, alongside of us and, and uh, we, I, we both started talking to him and Ernie was uh, talking to Steve about his casting. And I had mentioned to Ernie that I was going to go back and see the Darby's and Daddies and the Catskills in uh, about a week and a half or two weeks. And uh, that was that was one of my most amazing trips of my lifetime was to go back there and, and study the techniques of the, of the Catskill Fly Tank School mm. and sit there and watch uh, for two weeks, watch Elfie and Harry Tie Flies and go over to Deddy's house, uh, the Deddy's, um, mm -hmm. Walt, uh, Winnie, and Mary Tie Flies in the evening. And, uh, you know, just watch the different styles. Um, they were, t uh, between the Darbies and the Deddies, their style of flies were different, hmm. but both of them tied. I mean, every fly that came out of the vice was impeccable yeah. and you couldn't, you couldn't, you know, they were just unbelievable compared to what was here in Oregon. Hmm. You know, the stuff in Oregon at the time was chenille bodies and wool bodies and and a lot of hackle on it, big fluffy deer hair wings. And <laughs> where was that coming from? Where was that? You know the the cat skills thing. I mean, I'm not sure if you know the history there, but that's been an interest to me because I'm I'm not a great dry fly tire, you know, uh, you know, and uh, I'm always interested because those flies are so amazing and beautiful. Where did uh, why was it? I guess it started there and moved out west, or what, where did the cat cat skills thing? Well, I don't know. You know, it kind of moved out west, but it took a long, long time. And I remember talking to um, Clarence Schaff, and he said, yeah, if I probably would have gone back there and, and taken some classes, my flies would look a lot different. But he said, you know, out here, big, bulky, ugly-looking flies, that's what we tie out there. And, um, there, you know, there were a few people like... Um, Andre Pouillons, when he started his shop, he was he was trained a little bit in fly tying on the Catskill. So his flies were were slender and sparse, and that's the way they tied them back then. And it started with uh, Theodore Gordon. It was probably even before that. But, mm. um, <clears throat> there was just a number of remarkable tires. Rube Cross... Um, I saw some of his flies and I was just going, I, I was just, Harry Darby was showing me some of Rube's flies that were tied back in the thirties, thirties hmm. and forties. And, and they were just unbelievably sparse and the hackles were just like rock hard. Hmm. I mean, nothing, nothing like we've got today. Right. And, uh, so when I was, when I was back there, I was able to, I was already raising my own birds. I had, um, I had opened my fly shop at my house in Eugene in 1969 and it was called my flies. And, uh, it was basically a mail order. There wasn't many people in Eugene that tied flies, even though there was a great history on the McKenzie. Um, and very, very few people knew how to dub, you know, like seal fur. I had lots of seal. I, I had uh, sheared uh, beaver, um, so I had that dyed in different colors. And people would come into my come into my shop, which was at my house. It was in a separate building, and they would look at all the colors and just be amazed because they've never seen this stuff. Hmm. You know, it was just hardware stores around Eugene that sold a little teeny bit of fly tying material, and it was maybe ten colors of hackle and. Um, hmm the hackle was just individual feathers stuffed in a bag, uh, in a, in Indian capes, things like that. But, um, wow. So you, you had your own, I mean, you, you had your own animals and birds and, I mean, basically you were kind of like a, um, you know, before hairline, right. was down there. I mean, or whatever you were, you were that for the, for the, for your area that you were, was, was there anybody else doing it? Well, there was another, Bill Hunt had a little shop um, at his house. He was a river guide, but it was, you know, basically what he sold was just wool and chenille for bodies. Mm -hmm. That was all there was. 
And um, I was just reading these old uh, fly tying books, uh, primarily from the East Coast, and admiring the beautiful flies they had. So I had this idea, and uh, Art Flick came out with the Master Fly Tying Guide in 73, and I picked that book up in 74. Um, and I was able to get a, get in contact with Art Flick and talk to him. And then uh, Ted Niemeyer, uh, I sent Art some flies, and I'm sure they weren't very good, and I never got a response from him. So later, I taped out a couple of my blue dun uh, roosters and I sent the tapes to him and man, I got a phone call. And he said, where'd you get those? And I said, I raised them. Hmm. And, uh, he sent, he told me, he said, uh, contact the Darby's and have them, you know, buy some flies from them and study the flies. And then, and then Ted Niemeyer said the same thing. I think that was probably Ted that told me that. And he said, uh, study the flies and AJ McLean had, uh, the fly tying section in the book, and I, I believe that was um, those flies were more or less the way that Elsie Darby tied her fly. So I worked on that for uh, six or seven months, and I sent Ted some flies, and he said it's time for you to get back here. And he said if you can make a trip, he said everybody's getting old; they're going to be gone, and you're going to miss out. So uh, um, after that conclave in Eugene. After I told Ernie, I took off uh, a couple of weeks later toward the end of June and spent two weeks at the Darby's house. And and uh, one day, all of a sudden, Ernie shows up with his um, publisher and uh, walks in. He goes, you did come here. <laughs> and I said, yeah, I told you I was. <laughs> I said, I'm probably the only person from Oregon that ever came and visited the Darby's. And they go, that's that's right. But they influenced they influenced a lot of people. Yeah, no, I've heard, I've heard uh, definitely. I know about them. I'd love to maybe on another episode. I, I'd love to find somebody and dig into the cat skills and, and that history there more. But um, you know, uh, for today, I did. You know, we're talking a little about fly tying here. I, I wanted to dig in a little bit, um, and we can swing back around to some of the history stuff because it is interesting with your shop and everything. Um, but on, on, can you maybe just start us off? I you know, for somebody maybe who has never done any material dyeing, can you talk about, you know, why you would want to do that and if people are still doing it and maybe just give us a general little quick little uh, rundown of what, what it's all about. Well, today there's, you know, today there's um, the, the wholesale business has really captured pretty much every color. Um, and back in, back in the, late sixties and early seventies when I was dying feathers. I mean, it was a process I had to do. If I was going to make money. I knew I had to, you know, dye my own materials process, whether it was natural materials. Um, I got furs and feathers from all over the world. Um, and it was basically from hunters. Um, I met John Capstick and his brother, Pete Capstick was a famous safari hunter and he, he uh, got in contact with his brother and said, what do you want? <laughs> and he would send me boxes of birds, um, monkey skins, all kinds of stuff <laughs> from Africa. And uh, back in those days, they didn't check those packages. And, and probably about 1983 or 84, um, we had to stop importing that because everything had to be identified by the scientific name. And those guys back in Africa, they didn't want to do that. So, hmm. uh, boy, I got some good stuff hmm. from them. Speckled bustard and, and the, the guinea skins were just gorgeous. But all that stuff, I needed to dye that um, for my mail order business. And um, my business started to grow, and I was advertising in magazines. And uh, in the... In my trip, when I went back east the first day, um, Ted Niemeyer took me to meet his friend, Eric Leiser, at Fly Fisherman's Bookcase. And I was out casting a fly rod um, in this little pond they had. And I noticed when I looked up on the 
building that I could see a couple of people looking out the window. And when I walked in, Eric goes, uh, the boss wants you upstairs. So I went upstairs and opened the door and Paul Jorgensen was standing there and he goes, who in the hell are you? He said, you can cast as good as Lefty Cray. And I said, well, I'm from Oregon. We have to make long casts. I said, I was just playing around with this little fiberglass rod. And Paul mentioned that he wanted to come out to Oregon and catch a steelhead and compare it with an Atlantic salmon. So um, unbeknownst to me, he showed up about a month and a half later, got a phone call from him in Ben, and he goes, Get the, get me out of here. He said, the mosquitoes are biting the hell out of me and told him to meet me in Oak Ridge. And I called my wife and and uh, said, I got to go on this trip for a week. <laughs> and I was <laughs> gone. And it was just, it was just the timing. I told Paul that I was, I had two weeks off from work and in the uh, last two weeks of August and it's kind of inconvenient. Um, but that, but that week, I watched him tie flies, um, and we kind of, um, I was doing these crossover flies from a, making a steelhead fly into something that was more like an Atlantic salmon fly, you know, the classic, you know, using polar bear and seal for the, the bodies. And that's, that's where I started uh, the beginning of, of redesigning. Um, flies and designing my own flies you know, with my colors that I dye. Um, now get back to dyeing. Hmm. It's, it's not a hard process. Um, typically, uh, these articles I've written for um, the Fly Time Journal is, um, you know, acetic acid, something that's stronger than vinegar, but it, it's, it's a vinegar base, but it's 30%, and that can be purchased at um, some hardware stores or, or purchased online from like Home Depot. Mm -hmm. um, you got to wait a few days and they'll, they'll have it ready for you, but it's a, it's a stronger uh, acid. Uh, so I use sulfuric on most of my materials, but people, you know, you're in your house and your wife is screaming at you, pouring acid down the sink and yeah. all it does is clean it out. Um, but it's, you know, it's temperature. Um, I've taught a lot of people how to dye. I've, I've dyed commercially for um, several companies, hmm. at least three, three different wholesale companies. Wow. Um, I did a lot of dyeing for Spirit River. Uh, I think I started working down there in 2009 or 2008, something like that, hmm. until they sold. All right. Um, and, and teaching the, teaching the different people, uh, that he had, how to, how to dye the feathers. It's not hard. It's just the water temperature has got to be at about 170 to 180 degrees on, on certain materials, 160, um, on, um, uh, materials that might, you, you, you would get some burning mm -hmm. if you went much much more, but most, most of the materials, 170 is a good, good figure. So you need a good thermometer and the acid and, uh, uh, the dyes now are easy to get on online. You just look up protein dyes and there they are. Hmm. And, uh, they're not, they're not too expensive in, in small sizes. I usually buy dyes, uh, some I get by the pound, but when I was when I had my uh, warehouse in this fly shop, I was buying dyes in five and ten pound containers, and uh, that that way um, the dye was really inexpensive. Even though it cost quite a bit, it was in in the usage it was inexpensive. But it was just dyeing; I could get any color that I wanted to get through the rainbow and, uh, and especially, um, using, um, agents that would brighten the feathers and then fluoresce them. And that's what I've been doing for probably 45 years, at least. Um, 
so almost everything, even even my natural uh, birds um, that I raise, I brighten those feathers and fluorescent duns, gingers, grizzlies, whatever. I always dye all that stuff, and then I put abalene oil um, on the feathers and then store them. And that way, I don't even have to ever use fly floating. Oh wow, that's a good that's a good tip. So, so like you said, the uh, the fly fishing and tying journal. Um, you've written some articles, and the cool thing is they're a sponsor of the podcast here, so it's always good to give give them a shout out, Craig and and the crew there. So, if they wanted to dig into, you know, if somebody wanted to do this, they could pick up that uh, article and 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 kind of get more details on it. Yeah, there's. Um... The last couple of issues, and then the, this coming issue will probably be the last one I'm dying, and it's about olives, um, olives and browns. And uh, but that those those uh, last couple of issues will give a person um, the real clue on on uh, the steps because everything is written right there. Just for future, uh, just for future, those that are listening in the future, right now it's uh, August 2020, so we're talking about the the summer edition and the fall edition of the Fly Fishing Tying Journal. Well, it was it was the it would be I think it's the winter of 2019, and then the spring issue of um, 2020, and then this um, article will come out in the fall edition okay. perfect because i had to skip one because i was taking care of my mother-in-law and moving and i just told craig i said i just can't finish this article right now yep i'm just you know, real busy getting her uh moved out i've taken care of my mother-in-law for a year and a half after my father-in-law passed away and so we just got her down to a senior center in Eugene and got her comforted and trying to get this house sold and cleaned up and and then once that's done in a couple of weeks, then I can go fishing. Yeah. <laughs> how, how, so are you doing all the sell? Are you doing the cleaning and the selling of the house? Well, we've got a realtor, but um, yeah. uh, my twin sister came down, and we had a big garage sale here uh, a week ago, and that was after four days of cleaning the house, and uh, we had a forty-yard dumpster and filled that in three hours, three right. and a half hours. So, huh. forty-five years of living here. So, how how's the market? Uh, the how's the market in in Albany that right now? Is it pretty pretty good? The seller's market. Yesterday we put the house up for sale. Monday afternoon and yesterday it was nonstop. Huh. Until eight thirty. Wow. Nine nine o'clock in the morning till eight thirty. It was nonstop. And everybody that came by wanted to buy it. Amazing, because it's a beautiful it's a beautiful acreage up on top of hill in North Albany, and there's uh, three acres here, and then oh, there's wow. fifteen acres behind it. So I've got some monster black tail no uh, bucks that I feed every day. I mean, really big. They're just magnificent. Yep. Along with all the other critters. That's cool. That's <laughs> which cool. I like. What are you? I'm just curious. I'm kind of in the housing market too. I'm just curious prices. What What is that three acres? What are you guys selling that for? Uh, five fifty. Five fifty. Gosh, that, that sounds like a pretty good deal, actually, for <laughs> some of the places up. Well, the, we've got yeah. we've got to make a quick sale because um, we need we need cash to. It, it costs four thousand dollars a month to keep Beth in that senior center. Oh, and, uh, right, right. So we need we need to get the cash out of here quick. So we yeah. decided to. Gotcha. Um, there's sellable property in the front where they can build like. Between four and six homes, so oh, there's no builders that want to buy that. Oh wow! And then the the back two acres is all woods. <clears throat> wow, that's, so a, it's, that's it's, really cool. It's a pretty place. It's a big house too. Yeah, it's a big house. I just finished painting it. Huh? Dang, um, you're, you're doing some serious work. Yeah, we had to huh. get it done. 
Nice. Well, let's uh, let's bring it back to the um, you know, we're talking about the, the dying. So, so we've got a resource. The Fly t- uh, Fishing Tying Journal has some of the stuff that you know we're not going to go into here. I mean, what else would you you know talk about? You know, with material dying is, wh- why would you want to do it now? If all the wholesale companies are there still people doing it other than yourself? Oh, there's a lot of people that I t- that I've uh, taught, and they just have fun with it. But it's it's you can get colors. You can get shades of of um, reds or purples or blues that aren't available, and it's just by mixing colors. And when you're in the, um, for example, when I when I dyed materials for the wholesale companies, uh, they have samples, and you've got to be dead on those samples, or they just they just. They don't want, no, that color is just a little too far off. And I go, come on, give me a break. Wow. No, it's, it's, it's a little different. It's too different. You know, most of these people don't tie flies. They don't fish. They're just workers. But it's, it's tough to match uh, certain colors from companies that, um, um, so one night I went in there and I pulled the sample cards off and put new sample, new samples of my stuff in there. Because you don't know what dyes um, they were purchasing these materials from another company, and you don't know what type of dyes they're using. Yeah, and so it's 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 hard to match. But when you're dyeing materials for those companies, I like to blend colors. Usually two or three, up to five different colors. That's uh, five is kind of uncommon, but. Uh, purple shades, I usually do um, two or three, maybe four colors. It's it's fun. It's fun. It's not real expensive because you can purchase dyes now over the internet, and uh, some of them cost, a, you know, an ounce of dye cost uh, five dollars, and an ounce of dye can probably dye three or four pounds of material. In, in uh, certain colors, the darker colors need, especially like black, you need more. As a, as the shades get darker, you need a little bit more dye. But hmm. most of the time, I'm I'm only using a an eighth to a sixteenth of a teaspoon for wow. the fe- feathers and furs that I need. Wow. You know, I, I just do small quantities for myself, and then when I do bulk, um, it'll be a teaspoon or a tablespoon of dye um that's why we buy large quantities you know poundage wise but for the for the guy at home um they can purchase all the stuff online and there's lots there's lots of videos on dyeing. most of the videos that i've seen they use just vinegar white vinegar and you can use that but you have to use heat so you got to bring the temperature up 170 to 180 degrees to set the dye. And it really doesn't set that well. <clears throat> so that's why I've told people to try to try to get acidic acid, um, at mm-hmm. least that. And if they can get muriatic acid, which they can get at the brick stores and, and paint shops, um, that's, you know, hydrochloric. Mm. Um, that really sets a dye, and you just need a few drops of that in the water, you know, oh, maybe wow. a quarter of a teaspoon or something like that. And that um, most of the color blues don't work well with it because it turns them green, but most of the other colors, the oranges, yellows, orange, reds, purples, and black, um, that's the way to go with that stuff. And it's not that expensive. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. So, so let me run di- uh, through this just to make sure, just to roughly the, the process, you know, t- t- correct me where I'm wrong. But so, I mean, you basically, you, let's say I have this chicken, you know, I've got some feathers, some, uh, a hackle, a cape or whatever. I can mix that in with, you've got some like a 30% vinegar mixed with sulfuric acid and then the dye and, and then mix those together in, in on like, I mean, you can throw it in a pot on the stove to a 160 degrees and then toss in your your feathers and leave them in there for a few minutes or is that kind of what we're talking about here yeah you don't you don't need to mix acids you're either going to use um you're either going to use um um 
muriatic acid, for example, or or um, vinegar base um, acid. So you don't need to mix the two. I use stainless steel, and um, <clears throat> because the acids of, um, affect aluminum, especially like muriatic acid, it'll start. You'll mm-hmm. see the bubbles start coming out of the out of the aluminum, and it'll just eat right through it. Wow! So I use stainless steel, and I tell people, I said, you know, go to Goodwill. They got lots of stainless steel pots there. Um, typically, I use a two-gallon pot. Um, doesn't matter how much water you put the dye in there, it's going to be absorbed in the material. And uh, whether it, whether it takes two minutes or fifteen minutes, the the dye is going to be absorbed, no matter um, hmm. no matter the size of the pot. You know, a quart size pot or a half gallon size pot. I use when I do just small amounts of fur or a dozen feathers or maybe a golden pheasant crest that I want to dye a certain color. And, um, those, those work. So I got, a, I got a lot of stuff at, as far as stainless steel. And, uh, cause I've been, like I said, I've been dying for, um, feathers and furs for 45 plus years. That's probably it. 50 years right right huh so 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 you get the uh stainless steel pot and then when you have your hackles what remind me again what what the, the steps are just kind of quickly what are the steps so you have your, well when yeah. you get them yeah you know, when you get your materials you want to i use dawn to wash them off so you got to wash your materials off wetting them and then um heat your water you got to have a good thermometer and bring your water up to um I put the acid in first, especially muriatic. You've got to put that in cold water. You don't want hot water. But I usually, um, <clears throat> in the two-gallon container, I put about a gallon of water in there, add my acid, and then I bring the temperature up. And once it's past like 130, 130, 140 degrees, when it's kind of hot to the finger, then I'll um, add my dye, and I'll stir it for like a minute, um, make sure it's all dissolved because it's powder, mm-hmm. powder dye. And there's some liquids that, that you can use, um, like RIT. Um, and then once I get up to 160, 165 degrees, I'll put my materials in there and start stirring them. And then I check the temperature when it gets to about 170. Um, then I'll shut the stove off and stir the materials every couple of minutes and of course like black um anything black i'll bring up to about 180 and uh, let that sit for a half hour take the materials out and then i'll usually do it another time add a little bit more black dye heat it back up put the materials in there just so it doesn't have a brown brown or green tinge to it but that's about the only color that um, is the black's probably difficult in getting it done on the first time hmm. for for amateurs. So yeah. I usually just tell people, I said, do it, do it twice, do it twice, and then and then once they've been in there for a certain amount of time and they're looking, I mean, how do you know when they're ready to be pulled out? You know, yellow is an easy color, so you know you can look in there and it, it's yellow and three minutes or five minutes or you can get a deeper yellow if you leave it in there for 15 or 20 minutes orange is the same way red's the same way you know you can pull out individual feathers um put them through a paper towel and shake them around and within a minute or so they're dry and you can look at them well is that red really deep enough Mm -hmm. or that might take a little bit longer so you can just reheat the you know, turn the stove back on and um, bring the temperature of the water back up and then just let it soak. Because once you figure out the amount of dye um, per inches of feathers, and like I said, if there's, say, six inches of strong saddle hackle or neck hackle, I only use an eighth of a teaspoon at, at, yeah. at most. And that's not very much. No. And when you get these ounce uh, containers, um, you're probably getting, um, 
maybe 12 to 15, mm-hmm. um, eighth of a spoon bowls in there. So it's, you know, it's inexpensive. And like I said, I, I play around like one of my purples. Um, I'll, I'll use um, hot pink, blue, and then purple. And I get a really beautiful color, especially on grizzly necks. I get all those colors are on the neck. You'll see pink, you'll see the blue streaks, and you'll see the purple. I just don't let it sit in purple all that long, maybe long. a minute. So that's that's the thing is the longer you let it sit, the longer it the dye takes effect. And then once you're finished and you think you have the right color, when you pull it out, wh- what do you do? Do you just set it on some paper or yeah. how do you dry it? Well, you rinse Yeah, you rinse it off. Um, you rinse it off in warm tap water. And then uh, I just, like on capes, I just hang them. I've got a, I've got a, a clip on a wire and I just hang them and let them dry. And once uh, I let them dry for about a for for about a day and then I press them in between a phone book so they're nice and flat. Gotcha. You know, we used to use cardboard and put put um, bricks on them with a fan and uh, that would that would dry them out real good too. When when I did hundreds of them at a time. Yeah. You know, we laid boards or you know something heavy on these cardboard. Hmm. So it sounds like a pretty uh, pretty fun process, you know. I mean, it's like you're you're kind of like a little mad scientist in there making your own, you know, color and oh yeah, and you can, you know, that's a cool thing. Is although the the wholesale market has tons of colors, I mean, you could still come up with something that's unique. And it's just like fly tying, right? I mean, you're tying your own flies, and this is like one step further to creating the colors and being part of the whole process, right? Well, in the in a sense, that's why people purchase the flies from me because the colors that I use, um, I mean, their catch rate went way up. Hmm. Right. And, and, and I tell them, I said, it's, it's probably the style and maybe you didn't use jungle cock, you know, you bought flies that didn't have jungle cock is that's, that's real important for me on the steelhead flies at least. Um, because those are really essential on uh, pretty much all the patterns that I've developed. Yeah. Um, I've just seen a, a, you know, 10 or 20% increase in the number of fish taken on a fly. And when you've got customers, that's a good thing about having a fly shop. You can experiment. And these customers are your, your um, experimenters. They go out and they come back and they say, God, that fly worked. And so it's going to be in the box. That's I've it. developed a lot of flies that didn't, didn't catch hardly anything or nothing and then there's just every once in a while you hit a you hit a fly that just starts hammering the steelhead yeah or trout that's and uh that's cool uh, you mentioned the the shop i wanted to bring it back to that just quickly because you talked about i think it was uh it was 1969 um, right you started the shop uh, my flies in in your um kind of at your house i mean can you take us through like, where did it go from there? Did you actually open up eventually? An, Cause I remember Shuey talking, John Shuey was on in a past episode. I remember him talking about, you know, hanging out in your, in your shop and stuff. And so did you have a, did you move that store into a bigger place? And then, and then what happened over time? Well, what, what happened? Um, I went, it was, it was primarily, there was no business in Eugene, just like Bill Hunt, the old river guide said. And, uh, so I, I started a, mail order business and it, it started growing probably 72 73 it started to climb and i ran some ads in fly fisherman magazine and and uh sts uh which were real good and so i started getting a customer base and it was 200 and then 400 people um and when paul jorgensen came out to fish with me on the North Unquaw in 1975, he brought the owner of uh, Fly Fisherman's bookcase with him and the vice, the president and vice president of um, Sam Melner and, and Phil. Um, a few months later, after they were looking at all the stuff in my shop, and of course I had three acres behind my house, and I had these flight pins with all these roosters in it. <laughs> hmm. 
my neighbors hate my neighbors hated me because those birds just crowed all the time. Oh, wow. uh, but Sam came out unbeknownst in October, and he just had a blank check. Knocked on the door about seven thirty at night, and I opened the door, and here he's standing there, and he's got this blank check, and he said, "I'm buying you out." And uh, so he looked at all the materials and the, he said, we can sell all the stuff because he goes, even though we process our own materials, you know, we got nothing like this. And so we boxed it all up the next day and he wrote me a check and I signed this contract that I couldn't compete in the mail order business for a couple of years. And uh, it was a, it was a big check. Hmm. And so I, I uh, stuck that money in savings, and the next year I flew back. Um, I knew where some prominent um, wholesale furriers were, so I flew back to um, New York and went out on uh, Long Island and went to this furrier, and I just couldn't believe it. It was just massive, tens of thousands of skins in there, and I bought Cabo stuff, and then I went down to California and um, got a bunch of uh, Chinese um, capes had just come into America for the first time, so I bought 700 or some 750 of those, and I just started, you know, I bought a bunch of seal, 40 pounds of seal, I bought a couple of polar bear hides, and um, probably had those, and I bought 100 jungle cock necks, and at that time, they were they were almost, you know, super difficult. And then I got into salmon fly tying materials in a little bit after I met Jorgensen. And it took it took time for people to get this stuff started. So, um, in 1977, I opened a shop up in Salem, Oregon, and uh, and then from there. I went back in once my contract was up, I went back in the mail order business and that, that was the only way that, that, uh, the fly shop could last. And I built thousands and thousands of fly rods over the years. And then, uh, eventually in early nineties, I started making my own fly reels and I had a warehouse, uh, got a 2,000 square foot warehouse where I processed materials and had a rod room upstairs. So I did 10, I did 10 fly rods every day, six days a week. Wow. And, uh, you did a lot of, so that was your thing. You were a custom, just like with the materials, you were building custom rods, custom. I mean, that was, well, you had to make, you had to make money. Yeah. You know, I had, I don't know, I had five, five, six employees and you had to make money. Oh, wow. And, so, uh, the rods, the rods were the, you know, every, every rod that I sold, um, per day. And like I said, I was selling, I was selling way more than 10 rods a day. I just couldn't build them fast enough. No kidding. Who is your, who are your, uh, or what was the name of the fly shop? It was McNeese's fly shop. McNeese's fly. Okay. And in Salem, and that's the one Shuey I think was talking about. And then, who were the six employees? Oh, there were just various people over the over the years. Yeah, uh, Brad Burden. I uh, he was one of my favorite employees, and then I had George Tukey, who was a retired school principal, and uh, he was always dependable because he would show up for work on time. Uh, <laughs> some of the other employees uh, were always late. Uh, <laughs> They're but out fishing. It was that's the yeah, other out fishing, right? <laughs> well, it wasn't that? Oh, it wasn't always, but yeah. uh, some sometimes they were out fishing. But getting back to the fishing point, when I opened that business in '77, there wasn't much of a steelhead run yet in the North Saint Am. But the next year in '78, there was fifteen thousand, almost sixteen thousand fish came over Willamette Falls, and that river was loaded. And that, that really helped my bottom line. Cause I was making no money in that shop because oh, wow. I had to wait another year before I could, I could actually, um, uh, sell, um, mail order again. Oh, right. 
and because um, huh. that's that was the only way. There wasn't enough anglers in the Willamette Valley to support a fly shop unless you were mail order. Right. Wow. That's just it was just real real hard. I think over the years it must have been at least uh, four or five fly shops that failed in Salem. No kidding. Yeah, there's and they're all gone now. Yeah, there, there's. Are there any shops right now in Salem? No. Hmm. Is that because no, the? Uh, well, I guess it's just a tough. You don't have a. Um, uh, yeah, why, why is that? You think Salem? I mean, there's one in Corvallis. Well, uh, well, there's one. There's a shop here in Albany. Oh too. wow. Um, I go. I go in there. Um, What's that? Every one called? you know, every couple of weeks. A Twin Rivers, I think. Oh, yeah. It's a nice little shop. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's, you know, I sold everybody in Salem. I sold them rods, reels, lines. And, and uh, before my shop, I sold my shop in 1994. My wife uh, had cancer and she passed away. So I sold the shop. And just maintain the warehouse. So I did materials, the rods, and the reels out there for um, another uh, four years, hmm. and then uh, and then I went into the landscaping business. No kidding, in Portland, and did that for uh, ten years, and and then kind of kind of dropped off um, a bit. And then uh, finally retired here a couple of years ago, and still have a still have a couple of landscaping accounts just to keep money rolling in, so I can buy some more cane rods. <laughs> so the landscape out of everything you've talked about since nineteen uh, whatever it's been sixty five here, um, you know, landscaping that seems like the outlier. Why, why landscaping? Well, I just love it. I I love to work hard. I mean, that's the one thing in the fly shop. Um, I had a discussion at one of Ed Rice's um, sports shows uh, in San Mateo. He wanted me to speak, and there were all these fly shop owners there. And I said, the problem with you guys is, I said, how many people um, work 18 hours a day? Nobody. <laughs> is that what you, you know, do? I'm, you know, Craig, yeah, Craig Matthews, you know, I... I haven't been back there for a long time, but I would go in the back room and, you know, he was stirring the soup just like Bob Borden and Hairline used to do. And Bob worked long hours. I mean, it was, he wanted, he wanted nearly a hundred percent, um, stock, you know, back orders don't make you money. So you got to work long hours. Well, when I built 10 rods a day, imagine how many hours that takes to build 10 rods. No kidding. Have you always been a, you know, 18 hours a day? And, and with that, I mean, how many hours are you sleeping? Has that always been your thing? Well, I wouldn't say every day was 18 hours, but the longest, the longest times were probably that, but 10, 10 or 12 hours was, uh, um, pretty much an average day. And, you know, I skipped out a little bit. I'd go bass fishing. I had some property on the Willamette and, and John Shuey would go, Oh, you're down at the bar or, <laughs> you know, you're out bass fishing. And I said, well, I got to get away for an hour because yeah. I love to bass fish. I mean, yeah. that's, that's one of my favorite things. Um, and just from childhood fishing the ponds there around on some stadium. And now a quick word from our sponsor. Here you go. FTJ Angler has a great fall edition that's out right now. You can find Lucas Stevens, who visits Winston Fly Rods in the uh, fall edition for an insider look at, and a rare interview with writer Ted Leeson, someone I hope to have on the podcast soon. Patrick Wall pays homage to Harry Lemire's Tide in Hand Atlantic Salmon Flies displayed in the Marguerite Salmon Museum. Boots Allen takes us to the pond with a master class in Stillwater. Dennis Dobble travels to Scotland in search of Atlantic Salmon. Plus, FTJ Deputy Editor Henry Hughes with a mysterious fly fishing story and Nora Etsy with her poem, No Business, which I actually tried to read unsuccessfully a few podcasts ago. I'm not sure if you remember hearing that, so stay tuned till the end. I'm going to try to read this one again and see if I can uh, come through, come through with the win here. 
Um, I'd love it if you could press pause right now, head over to ftjangler.com and subscribe so you get the next issue delivered right to your inbox. That's ftjangler.com. Godfishing.com can be your trusted source of information with access to the world's best fishing trips. Their sole purpose is to help you plan the most authentic fishing adventure while making sure it fits within your budget. If you want to find out which of uh, our trips we have available right now, you can head over to wetflyswing.com slash gotfishing and uh, enter your email and you'll get updated when the next trip uh, is available and you can see what we have going there. Uh, we have a pretty amazing uh, Yucatan trip coming up here uh, in the not too distant future. So if you're interested in, in heading out uh, for some sun and salt, uh, head over there and uh, sign up for the uh, that email there. Uh, Brian and the crew definitely have us covered here at Got Fishing. You can uh, also give them a call if you have any specific questions at 208-630-3373. Okay, back to the show. John Shuey was, um, I mean, when I think of mentors and things like that, it seems like you were a pretty big mentor f- for, for John early on. I mean, he's become kind of a, a big name, right, in, in the fly fishing space. He was just a kid, and it was like several there was at least there was at least four, at least four or five uh, young teenagers that used to come in the shop, and all of them went into the fly fishing business one way or the other. Some uh, uh, one one became a guide. Uh, one uh, worked for Gamagatsu, and that's how I got my uh, fly hooks, which we haven't talked about. That's how I got my fly hooks, uh, the blue heron spay hooks is because I knew Doug was working there and he, um, he said, yeah, let's get this going. And, um, guy full heart, he became a fishing guide and guided in, um, at the, uh, lodge in Alaska where I guided out of. And then eventually he, uh, went to Kamchatka and then, uh, to the Bahamas. And, uh, John Shuey was, you know, he was probably, 14, 15, when his parent, when his mother would bring him by the shop and just drop him off. He was just a little, he was just a little pest all day long. But I taught him, you know, he, he learned to tie flies and that's why his flies look very similar to mine. Um, you know, real good fly tire, knowledgeable guy. And we chat, we chat often or text often. Do you? You still you, you still uh, talk to John quite a bit? Oh yeah, yeah. He texts me um, a number of times per month. He's out out and about, and he'll see a butterfly and take a picture of it. And he goes, "What's this?" And it, in fact, this is a funny story. Last last year, he came down to the house, and he goes, uh, he was looking at materials and stuff, and he goes, "Oh, I want to see your butterflies," and he had no idea. And I, I, um, opened up my metal containers, which are, which I hold, uh, 24 drawers. And I started opening them up. John goes, Oh my God, hmm. there's thousands of butterflies here. And I go, let's go upstairs. <laughs> so I took him upstairs and I started opening them. He was going, pick it up. Really? I go, I, I go, John, I've, I go, I've probably mounted 40,000 butterflies, probably more than that. Wow. That's so cool. I said, I didn't tell anybody cause it's kind of like a nerd thing. Yeah. But when I went out fishing, that's, you know, my kids, my, my, uh, kids have really enjoyed, uh, collecting and, uh, I raised nine nine kids for a while, you know, over the, over the years. And, um, five of them, um, were kind of, uh, stepchildren, yeah. but they're all real. They're all real great. We get together and have our birthdays and, uh-huh. and, uh, the boys want to learn how to hunt and they're in their thirties. So that's cool. That's well, yeah, one thing I, I can say fishing was one of my subjects. Butterflies were, another subject and hunting was the other thing that I did bird hunting. And so, well, I did bird, everything. Yeah. Big game. Elk and deer and antelope and, and, uh, yeah, I hunted, I hunted extensively. I got it up in Alaska. Oh, wow. Wow. 
And that all comes back. Yeah. You know, I mean, obviously you, you, at the start you talked about, I think it was your grandfather, right? That was that the person that kind of got, yeah. who, who, is that who you, when you look at how that got you started in the outdoors, is that, that was the person? Well, I, he passed away just before I was born. Oh, okay. But the one thing he left, the one thing he left was his tackle. Oh, wow. And grandpa, I mean, there was on the ceiling of the garage, there were all these cane rods and nearly, I mean, they were huge cane rods. They were cheap. They weren't Leonard's or Payne's or anything like that. And he bought them. I uh, remember, um, it was some hardware store in Wichita, Kansas, and he would buy them by the dozen and then go down to the road. And almost all these rods were broken. <laughs> the tips were broken. <laughs> so he apparently caught some, uh, I don't know if he jerked too hard or, but he apparently caught a lot of fish. And I saw pictures of, um, my father when he was young on the McKenzie with my grandfather. And uh, he had a permit to catch 250 trout. I believe it was a week uh, to feed the poor people during the depression at church in uh, Eugene. And there was a photograph of a rope going between the tents. He just had a permanent tent camp up above uh, uh, Rainbow on the McKenzie River way up the McKenzie and these, these fish, there was, um, 10 fish and it said 70 pounds plus. And that's the kind of trout that were in the McKenzie. And I got to, I got to see them in 59 and 60. And then they just started disappearing. You couldn't kill, um, a trout over 14 inches. So I don't know why these big trout disappeared. Somebody was killing them. Yeah. Crazy. And I, I, uh, there was a general, uh, Cy Perkins that lived up above McKenzie bridge. And I, I caught worms for him and he'd give me 20 bucks for a gallon of worms. And I went up and stayed at his house, his cabin, uh, for a couple of days. And he went out there with a bobber and flipped the worms out, and put about four or five worms on a big hook. And I saw this trout that was laying on the shoreline. It was as big as a steelhead. And it just swam out, grabbed the worm, boom, 25 inch fish. 25, 26 inches. And they were there, especially on the South Fork of McKenzie. What, um, so do you still have any of those old, um, any of your old grandpa's uh, cane rods or any of that stuff? Yeah, there's still some hanging around. And I got a, the, the, Neat thing is I've got a lot of his rogue river flies. I sent a picture to John Shuey a couple of months ago, and I said, look at the heads on these flies. I mean, they, the heads were just huge. They must have used a, a three feet of nine mole thread. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a, a small size eight double, you know, rogue river special, and it's got this, they're all, that's the that's style huh. um, back then. And, uh, that was what Harry Lemire was telling me when he did the flies for, um, Trey Combs, but he said, well, Frank Amato wanted big heads on the fly. So I just wrapped a bunch of thread on that. <laughs> nice. And then you see Sid, you know, get to Sid Glasso. Then you see Sid Glasso's flies and you go, Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you, um, I'm glad you brought up Sid uh, uh, Glasgow uh, Glasso because I we had I wanted to touch on that a little bit. Um, but before we do, I had one comment or one question on here. I wanted to get back to you. Just it's one that I've been wanting to ask you about. You know, and, and this I and I asked this because I think it, it maybe helps people understand a little bit about you know kind of the industry and kind of things. And and I'm not sure exactly the the breaking the law or how how you, I think you got did you get in trouble importing or something like that? Can you talk about that? I, I'm not sure where I heard that from, but is there any truth to, the, to that whole story? Well, I took up, I was hunting, I was guiding a trip in Alaska and I took a, a Boone and Crockett caribou and we got stuck. We had um, Mount Katmai erupted. So we were stuck out in the, on the Aleutians for three or four extra days. 
and uh, I brought my cape in and I brought it down to Salem and the guy sent it off and the cape came back and the hair bunch of hair was gone. So the next year I was uh, doing a moose hunt and caribou hunt and I stopped by a taxidermist um, and he said he could get me a, a real nice cape. And so I gave him 250 bucks and I happened to ask him, I said, do you get any polar bear hides mm -hmm. in, I mean, legal stuff. Yeah. And he said, well, every once in a while. So a couple of weeks later, I get a phone call from a, a couple in Anchorage and they had a hide for sale, but it was $10,000 and I, you know, Jeez. with a head and a claws. And I said, no, I can't do that. And then shortly after that, I got a call from another guy and he said, well, he said, uh, my brother's got this cape. Um, and he goes, I'm a guide. And when I go, um, to the Brooks range to hunt doll sheep, I'll pick the cape up and, and, uh, bring it back and send it to you. So we talked a little bit. My wife was basically dying of cancer at the time. And, you know, it's, but anyway, uh, I told him after, uh, after my wife passed away, I wasn't interested in it because I was thinking about just closing everything up and, and, uh, yeah. we had a five-year-old daughter just taking care oh, of her. Wow. Anyway, he sent me the cape unbeknownst. I just walked into the warehouse and here this box was at the, at the doorstep. So I opened it up and I go, this is a real scam because it's a fresh freshly killed bear what and so the next day the the uh, fed showed up nine rick showed up and they they had a search warrant just for that one box and i said there it is hmm. and uh the guy looks at the box and he goes whoa you didn't cut it up or anything and i said no that's an illegal scan and so they ended up taking everything out of the warehouse in their nine suburbans. They took all my records. They destroyed my um, disc for my customer list. And the guy goes, you're out of business as of today. Really? And later, a year later, um, they found that there was no, that I didn't do anything wrong. So they just dropped it. And, um, they didn't charge me for anything. And I said, well, you destroyed my business for no reason. You didn't wow. even have a warrant to take all this stuff. You took all my files, you took everything and you destroyed them. Jeez. And, um, but two years, well, it's a year and a half later, all of a sudden I started getting phone calls from my customers and they were really upset. And they said these agents came into our house and they just tore our house apart and Jeez. left. So what I found out here not many years back, I had a Supreme Court judge um, retired that fly fishes and he brought a polar bear, half a polar bear hide over to my house to die up. And it was a real, real old one. And um, it was a brain tan skin so it didn't die up very well i had to pin it to a screen and and uh, soak it soak it in a tank and and then let it dry but it was real gummy and tacky and mm -hmm. anyway he said give me your records on that and about two weeks later after i got the job done he came over to the house and he said these are the records that they withheld wow. and uh, they you know Federal agents, even though they're fish and wildlife, they couldn't identify anything in the shot. I mean, they don't know anything about those those nine guys. Didn't know anything about wildlife. They didn't know anything about feathers. Jeez. Um, they didn't know anything about deer hair, elk hair. And I said, "Geez, you should hire me. I know all this stuff." Um, but they said I was selling grizzly, which was grizzly hackle. And they and eagle, and eagle that we sold was just gray turkey marabou, natural turkey marabou dyed yellow for the 
Eagle yeah. Atlantic salmon flies. So it's very seldom did I ever sell that. I just had it in the catalog. But the grizzly, of course, grizzly is the most popular hackle there is. And yeah. I sold tons of it. And it and the Supreme Court judge in Oregon thought I was selling grizzly bear. And that's really bad. You can't sell grizzly bear. And that's what they charged me for. And I never knew that. So they charged so I got you, a felony. They charged you for selling grizzly bear, but you never sold grizzly bear. You sold grizzly hackle. Yeah. And, and I, I didn't know this until a few years ago. Wow. And, and my <laughs> my daughter said, "Well, we've got to get the, we've got to get an attorney and and uh, get this expunged." Yep. You know your felony expunged. And I said, "You know, it's too late." Here I am, almost seventy years old, and I said, "You know, I'm not going to travel the world." No. And you know, spend thousands, spend thousands of dollars um, getting this retracted. It's not not worth it. Crazy. So you have a felony conviction because of Grizzly, which they basically it sounds like the people that were on your case were totally were not knowledgeable, and they just kind of hacked hacked their way to kind of ruining your business well i looked in the i looked in the catalog i had a cat i've got an old catalog uh one of my mail order catalogs and i looked in there you can see the grizzly hackle but of course it says grizzly on it and this woman that was the um lead lawyer for the government um they never she never handed those the paperwork over at all so i got nothing we had my my attorney sat there. He was crying in front of the judge, hmm. and then the judge told him to leave. Really? And then the judge, yeah, and uh, so they ex, you know took him out, and he just chewed me out. But he didn't. He said, uh, "You're gonna you're gonna suffer. I'm gonna make you suffer." And boy, did he make me suffer! What? I had to do um, wow two. I had to work um, almost full time two years for um cleanup crews. Wow. I don't even really? want to tell you what I what I did. Holy it was it was God. bad. Yeah, and that judge wanted me in prison and boy, he he did everything. One one uh one particular day, which was at the end, I was getting really close to having my sixteen hundred hours in. I think I was like fifteen 85 or 1590 or something like that. And I was working at the Salem penitentiary pruning trees since I'm a landscaper mm -hmm. and they shut, they shut the prison down just so I wouldn't get through that day's work. What year was this? Um, 90, 97 oh, through yeah, yeah. 99. Long, yeah. Yeah. This is a long time ago. So 2000. So yeah, this is over yeah. 20, 25 years ago. Gotcha. So, Oh Yeah. So basically, no, I just, I, just, I mean, this know. seems crazy, Dave. I mean, you, you, it sounds like you just got totally screwed by, I mean, again, the, the government, right? I mean, you got screwed by this thing and, and I mean, what is your, out of all this stuff, what, what is your, what is your take home? I mean, what is your take home for, for us or anybody listening here? I mean, what, what's the message here? Is there any, is there any good, is there anything to learn from this? Well, I was in the papers all over the United States. I mean, that's, that's what they, that's what they wanted. They wanted they wanted people to know, you know, and it was like, um, you know, a couple of other businesses were hit over the years, but, um, this, this was a major thing. I mean, I had people calling me from all over the United States. Jeez, I saw your name in the paper or on wow. the news. Wow. How does, how does all this feel? You know, I mean, how did it feel then? How does it feel now for you? All that stuff that's gone down. Well, I, I, I mean, it doesn't even bother me anymore. I mean, it did, it, it did, uh, when I was working, cause I knew, I knew the judge was on my back cause he would call the, um, parole people. Um, in fact, they became my friends and, uh, <laughs> wow. so it was, it was kind of a, this is such a crazy, kind of an odd, odd deal. This is such a crazy story because I mean, literally it, it's almost it's funny now because I mean, it's fly fishing, right? I mean, literally we're talking about tying flies and you're talking about selling fly tying materials. I mean, you're not talking about, you know what I mean? Some 
very harm. It's this crazy thing. And the fact that you have a felony charge, isn't that, that blows me away. Yeah. That, it, it, I mean, it's in a sense it hurt, but you know, I was, I had my landscaping business at the time. And I mean, that's the reason why I got out of the fly fishing business. 97. I just said, you know, um, I was still, I still made reels and rods and, uh, did, did some material, yeah. uh, work for some of my old clients over the years, but I decided, man, I want a new career. No kidding. And I always took care of my yard. And so I saw a job opening in Portland and went to work for this company. And six months later, I was, uh, the foreman and, and, uh, we had wonderful, big, huge mansions and, um, uh, worked up there for a couple of years and I decided to go on my own. And so I got some great accounts and mm-hmm. did that for 10 years. Oh, 10, yeah, at least 10 years. And then, uh, just slowly, you know, slowly, um, um, moved one account away and another account away. And yeah, that's, that's what it comes down to. And you, then basically, retired. you basically went into the, the outdoor or into the, landscaping based because of that that whole felony thing i mean that got you that stirred you that makes a lot of sense yeah that was kind of a heartbreaker wow all right well i appreciate you dave clearing the air or at least explaining that because you know when you hear things out there i can't remember who i talked to about it but somebody had mentioned that and i'm glad i i've got the story documented from your side you know on on air i've had a you know this show i've had both i mean there's there's sides to the story but yeah i was shocked when when this um retired judge came and he had here i've got a half inch of paperwork and he comes with an inch you know Mm -hmm. probably 45 pages and i'm going through it and he's got this he's got his highlighted um marker and he said this is what they charge you for and i was looking at it go what no kidding you had no idea and he laughs yeah wow and he laughs and he said that's real serious stuff. But like I said, you know, it's way, way back. Yeah. So there's no reason even, no. even do anything no. about it. No, there isn't. But let's get on with glass. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there you go. You see, we, we were thinking like, you know, I've been thinking about uh, Sid for a while. So yeah. Let, tell me about, uh, let's start it off just with, um, you know, I mean, you're writing a book about him, a uh, book, right? I mean, to tell me about, maybe just start us off with the book. How did that come to be? And, and why Sid, because he's not well, a Eugene guy, right? Years, you know, I I met Sid back in 1975, um, and it was just later, probably 77, when I started my business, and that was when I started getting those materials from Africa. Sid didn't have a lot of stuff, a lot of materials. And you'd go to his house, and it was spotless. And you wouldn't tell he was a fly fisherman, except he had an Atherton painting on the wall um and that was it what's the, there was what, no what's the Afri- what is the painting well it was it was um atherton who was a uh real well-known fly fisherman and fly tire and and okay. he had painted a um picture for the anglers club and they did the prints and and uh um Sid had this, and of course, a friend of mine in Colorado has it sitting above his fly tying desk hmm. now. Um, beautiful picture of Atlantic salmon laying across a, a fishing net. Mm-hmm. That's the only thing you could see in Sid's house. Everything was put away, everything was spotless. Hmm. And uh, very few, if I, I know there's only a couple of people that ever saw him tie a fly. He was kind of a neat guy. I was warned um, from Wes Drain, who is a good friend of his. Wes said, don't ever ask for anything. Don't ever ask for a fly. And he said, um, you know, be real truthful with him. He said, if you want to give him materials, give him materials. But just don't ask for a fly or anything like that. He said, if he wants to give you something, he'll give it to you. And so I would take materials up to him. 
um, every, every year I'd go to this Ed Rice's sports show in Seattle and I would always stop by, you know, I'm up there for five days. So I'd stop by Sid's house once or twice during that time. And we would just sit and chat until one o'clock in the morning about material. And then, uh, after he passed away, he wrote me a letter, a little note card, just a few days before he passed away, thanking me for the materials and, you know, friendship. It was just a short little, little note. And by the time I got it, I'd already gotten the call that Sid had passed away. And I thought, guy, he just wrote this thing. Wow. Um, uh, but it was about 2005. I started calling his, uh, young friend, uh, uh, Wentworth and I started chatting with him. And so I was recording what Dick was saying about Sid. So I started a little notebook and I'd call him about every two weeks and we'd talk for an hour. And I thought, um, uh, I should, I should either write some articles or write a book. And then I remember this thing that Ernest Hemingway said, he goes, you don't want to write about somebody that died for, 10 years or 20 years and maybe even 30 years is better. And of course now it's 30, uh, five, 36 years since he passed away in 83. Um, and so I started putting together as much material. And of course, most of his friends are gone except for the youngest ones like myself and a couple of younger guys that, that knew him much better than I did because they lived right there. But I tried to gather as much information, and there's not a lot on Sid. And most of the stuff that's been on the internet for years is not true. You know, it's misconceptions. And the one good thing I got was uh, uh, Dick Wentworth got pretty much all of Sid's collection, his rods and reels and his flies. And I was able to obtain... um, several hundred of Sid's flies. So that was the reason why I wanted to do the book because I wanted to show people just, just how different his flies are. I mean, his orange heron, the orange heron that's in Trey Combs book of 76 is, is totally different from an orange heron that he would have tied 1980. Hmm. I mean, if, you know, like when you catch a butterfly, you put the type of locality down and all that, and, and you've got subspecies. And I just figure Sid's orange heron, uh, soul duck, and some of the other stuff, they're just, there's a whole bunch of subspecies. He changed those flies around with the materials. And just like Dick said, we didn't have a lot of stuff back then. And so we had to alter. He said, sometimes we use teal for the throat on an orange heron. Sometimes we use guinea. Mm-hmm. If we had it other times we used other stuff. Sid, um, his, uh, soul duck, um, the original feathers that he used for that were quite, um, seagull flank feathers that he'd pick up on the beach <laughs> and he'd dye them yellow until he got, um, you know, other, other materials like slopping or something like that. Gotcha. Wow. And he'd, you know, he'd pick up heron feathers and, um, I, I got a, another, one of Sid's friends said, uh, he had ordered heron from, uh, Messina, which is a company that, uh, Vineyard acquired, uh, back in the sixties. But he said, here's an order for three dozen heron feathers. 1955, 1957, 1959. Why three dozen? Every two years. His orange heron came out in 59, and he went up on the uh, Deer Creek, and Al Knutson was watching him fish. And Al, Al Knutson told me the story. He said, yeah, I watched this guy fish down through the river, and he caught five steelhead. He said that was something back in those days, for a guy to catch five steelhead. And then... Uh, Sid, Sid handed him a fly. He said, I'd never seen anything like this before. And that's when Trey Combs 
was doing his first book, um, Steelhead Trout, mm-hmm. in 19... Well, he started that book probably in the mid to late 60s. And he contacted... Uh, Knutson and uh, asked Knutson if there was somebody else that he knew that was a really good fly tire that he needed to interview or get flies from. And Al goes, yeah, there's a guy up in Forks, Washington. And he said, he ties these incredible flies. Never seen anything like it. And that's how uh, I've got the letter that that uh, the correspondence between Sid and, and uh, Craig Combs back in 1966 and it's interesting when I talked to when I talked to Trey about um, obtaining Glasso's flies there's a different story between what Glasso told me and what Trey told me (laughs) because Glasso didn't want to tie the flies for the book because he goes I don't sell flies and I know if my flies are in a book people are going to ask me about buying flies and I don't do that it ruined ruin my hobby, but there's a there's a lot of history um, in the book you're you're putting together. Are you covering like what is is it like his whole life or is it just like a section? Well, there's no, there's not a lot that I really know. You know, I'm just going to have um, a short um, chapter about his about himself and his life. You know, his family, his father, his mother. Um, his grandfather, and they came out right at the turn of the century uh, from Norway. And uh, his dad got a job at this private fish hatchery there in Washington. And that's, you know, that's where Sid caught his first steelhead. It was, we were laughing because I, to, I told him, I said, I caught my first steelhead when I was, um, I caught two steelhead when, when I was six years old, six years old. I just turned six. And, um, Sid goes, well, I beat you. I caught my first steelhead when I was five. (laughs) There you go. And we had a, but he was, he was a really, he was a gentleman. There were people, um, that didn't like him. Oh, really? Uh, I was talking, I was talking with, um, a couple of old gents and they, oh, he was an arrogant but you know, he didn't. He didn't come out. I mean, he had when he walked into a room, people came to attention. I mean, he was an important figure. Um, but he was kind of a recluse. I mean, yeah. people didn't really know him. Huh? When did he? So the period where he was really. Um, well, I mean, I guess there was multiple decades there. I mean, he's known for his fly patterns. I mean, what do you think, what makes his patterns unique? It seems like he stands out over everybody else. Why do you think that is? Well, it's the slimness of his patterns. It's like the Catskill tires. I mean, it's it, the, the flies that were sold in stores back then were big, thick, chenille-bodied, were wool-bodied flies. And then all of a sudden, here you see these these little teeny toothpicks and you go, God, why would a fish even hit that? Can't even see it. It's so thin. Yeah. Now we're all but using his, thin. Um, oh, I got mama deer coming up for food. Oh, cool. Yeah. we got deer. They're tame. Oh, cool. I can get out here and pet them. Yeah. I wish we had, I wish we had this on video so we could see the deer you're feeding, <laughs> you're feeding out, out of your hand there. <laughs> I'll send, I'll send you a picture of one that I'm petting. Okay, They're scratching yeah. his neck. Yeah, cool. Uh, anyway, uh, the remarkable, I mean, you can't imagine the stuff in this collection of flies. They're some of the neatest stuff. And, it, and it's, if you don't have the feathers in hand, you couldn't, you couldn't figure out what in the hell feathers he used on this fly. There was a minnow. And I was looking at it. Of course, it's just a silver body, and it's got a little bit of white polar bear. And then it's got a couple of black feathers on top of it that are kind of like teeny mini ostrich plumes. Mm-hmm. And of course, I knew what it was because I got a hooded mer- merganser skin, and it's the it's the uh, um, head feathers from a 
hooded merganser. Hmm. And there's, you know, they're white and black, but at the very back of it, all the feathers are black. And he put that on top of this fly. So I took the fly down to the McKenzie, put it in the water. God, it's just beautiful. Hmm. But it's, it's so slender. And then, you know, Sid, the neat thing is, I, I, there's not very many flies, maybe five flies that he tied in the forties before he moved to forks. And, um, they resemble the colors, you know, yellow was a real popular color back then. So they resemble yellow with red, um, yellow and orange. And they resemble what you would see in his uh, soul duck or some of the other flies. And they were tied with polar bear um, on, on CB hooks. And once he got to um, forks in the uh, late forties, he changed his hooks to vineyards. And I believe Alcock made the vineyard hook. Uh, and that's what he stuck with the rest of his life. He's, I've got his diaries and one, one of the diaries is his hook diary. So he's got all the hooks in there and he, he, um, uh, being a school teacher, he takes real critical notes. Um, so he's got what pound of liter for each size of hook that he uses. Um, but looking at his flies, when he when he moved to Forks, um, he obtained a couple of books on Atlantic salmon flies. And when he saw uh, Crossfields flies in there and some others, he goes, hey, and this is something he told me. He said, when I saw that, that fly right there in this book, he goes, I can do that and maybe better. Hmm. And... Uh, one of the one of the greatest photographs of Sid's flies is in Bates's uh, Atlantic Sa- last Atlantic Salmon um, book that came out, and there's a picture of of um, Preston Jennings. I think that's Lady uh, Three Lady Carolines, but there's a no, it's a purple um, spade that they've got in there, and it's uh, uh, Preston Jennings Glasso. And, um, oh God, the other English guy. Mm. Um, and they're all just gorgeous. That's cool. What did he, um, what did he teach? What, what grade or what, do you know what he did there? Um, when he left, when he left the Valley in Washington to go to Forks, he, um, he taught uh, social studies and I think math, and then he went back to he went back to school. I ch- I checked with um, the college up there, the Lutheran College, and he had gone back like three four times, and he became vice principal. I talked with a school teacher here about uh, probably ten years ago, and she said I was twenty three when I got there. And she goes, Mr. Glass- Glasso was uh, really strict. And you didn't want to cross that man. And even the kids even said that. Because <laughs> yep. he had a paddle and he had a whip. And he <laughs> wasn't afraid to use them. Wow. <laughs> but he was he was vice principal at the time. But he still, you know, it's a small school, small town. You know, there's a few thousand, maybe 3,000 people there at the time. Yeah. And probably uh you know i would imagine that would range from 700 to a thousand kids right on the flight tying i mean he was obviously a, a one of the greatest uh fly tires that we we know of i mean did he have any mentors how did he learn do you, do you know was it all self-taught no he was he was self-taught i mean he looked at those photographs on the book as as well as other people i mean a lot a lot of those great uh, tires from the Catskills, they were self they were self taught, or or they got a fly from Rube Cross and they'd take it apart and see how he tied it. That's how a lot of people did it. Mm-hmm. But looking at looking at some of the early flies, you know everybody's flies is 
uh, when they first start tying are, aren't very good. But today, you know, we just see these unbelievable tires that just pop out of nowhere and it doesn't take them very long. No. And, uh, it, you know, it, it took probably four or five years and then he, he got into this style. What is his style? What, what would you say his style is? I mean, it's, it's low profile, low, uh, is there a, a name for it? I guess it's just his, his name. Well, it's, 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 it's minimalistic in a sense. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, everything is slender. Um, you know, it's tight. He, he didn't tie with a bobbin. He used Nymo, which was a thick thread back then, but it was like floss when you, and Polly Rossboro used it. And a lot of, a lot of tires use it because it was the only, you know, they didn't use Nymo back East. They used silk. Um, but out here they use Nymo. I don't know how you can tie a size 16 dry fly with Nymo, but they did. Um, but his, his heads had a unique shape to it and they were, they were perfectly tapered. And then when Danville came out, um, he got that, of course, without a bobbin, Danville just wrapped like a teeny, teeny thread of floss and his heads reduced by 20 or 30%. And, uh, but comparing the flies that were tied at the time, um, Sid was just way, way ahead of his years, maybe 20, yeah. 20, 25 years ahead right. of everybody. Was he fishing for, I mean, these flies were for mainly for winter steelhead or what were the, what was he going for? Well, some, you know, the winter steelhead looking at the, looking at the diaries, they didn't catch that many steelhead. Uh, the rivers would come up, the steelhead would move in, they spawn and they back out. They caught a lot of, they caught a lot of spawn fish, but they didn't catch very many fresh fish. It was it was tough, you know. Sid developed that that uh, powdered bud line, and it gave him a an idea of nineteen. That was in nineteen forty eight, and it's a lead paint that they use on boats, and he would he would paint it on, on a silk core, silk line core and, um, uh, make these shooting heads. It's all written up. He's got really good details about the, the shooting heads. He's got his tapered leaders and the hook sizes for every pound test. And, and, uh, his winter flies were typically size one or one odd, uh, vineyard. The orange heron, but he, he had a he had a lot of other flies that he that he fished uh, for a winter steelhead. And Dick's Dick's diaries are really funny. Uh, his expressions of of uh, failures and and some of the days that were were good. And you know, one year he said, "I only caught three steelhead the whole year in a in a bunch of spawners," hmm. and that was typical. That was typical. They didn't have sinking lines until the sixties. Gotcha. So with those flies, Sid's flies are I mean, were they more designed for, for winter steelhead or a summer steelhead or, or both? Well, both. Both. He fished, you know, in the in the summer, like like he was saying in his diary and he told me, he said, You never knew what you were gonna catch. A sea run cutthroat, um, a jack salmon, or a small steelhead. And he said the steelhead our summer fish up here are small. And he said, uh, seldom did they get to be four pounds. So he wow. said, I like my, I like my, um, eight and a half foot pain. And, um, so his summer flies are very sparse, rather unique in all their characters. And then he's got his winter flies, which are big, you know, there's no lead on them. Um, there's, they're just pretty much the same. They've got that arc yellow, um, tag in the, in the back from the, from the tag forward about a third. And then he opens up the, the, uh, floss and then puts a little seal in there and then spins the floss and wraps it up the body. Hmm. And so that's, that's what most of his flies look like. 
No kidding. Yeah. And he didn't. He didn't very. He didn't very much. Uh, he's got some big Royal Coachmans. Of course, everybody fished Royal Coachmans back then because it was the most popular fly in the world. He's got variations of the, you know, variations of the Royal Coachman. He's got flies that look like a Royal Coachman, but you know they're different colors. Oh yeah, what's your uh, what's your go to fly for a summer steelhead? If you had to pick one for for fishing, well, the one I pretty much use most of the time is my purple polar bear matuka. Oh yeah, yeah yeah. You sent me. That's right. You gave me one of those. Or you didn't send it. You gave me when I met you at the uh, the Albany show. Yeah. I still have that. That's a good look. Yeah, that's that's a yeah, that's a fly that I fish most of the time. That's it. What's your style of fly tying? Would you say? I mean, if you had to, we talk about Sid's style was kind of a uh, minimalist. What what would you say your your style is? And who was your your biggest influence? Well, it's um, you know I studied that like Atherton. I studied his flies, and I actually got a set of. Um, I got a set of his flies from two different people back in the in the seventies, and uh, took photographs of them, and then sent them back. Um, I just I, I mean, it's the reason why I made my own fish hooks. Um, I didn't like I didn't like the partridge flat flat hooks, um, the flat shank. So I took and reformed the shank and then I met Alan Bramley at Partridge. He came out to my shop in Salem in 1978 and I showed him these hooks because they fit the style. They they would make the fly look better. At least in my in my mind and other people's minds. And it was just a slight change in the in the shape of the hook. In the in the shank. Mm-hmm. Just a little bit just a little bit more uh, uh, bend bend there. And, you know, but I used golden pheasant, um, crest for tails. I started dyeing those back in the late sixties, um, all different colors. I'd bleach them out. So they were, get them, you know, pretty close to white and then dye them all different colors. People had never seen that stuff before, That's but cool. I couldn't even, you know, it, I couldn't even sell the stuff when Jorgen came when Jorgensen came to the, to my house after our fishing trip with him on the North Umpqua, he was just looking at this stuff and he was going, Holy crap. And so he grabbed a whole bunch of stuff, you know, that he grabbed a bunch of seal and, and, uh, cress and took them back with him back to New York. Yeah. That's cool. But you know, the style, the style is, um, it's, it's kind of hard to explain. It just, I just got, I, I tied a fly one day and it looked really good. And I think that might've been with Paul. Um, he was helping me out with a little bit of stuff and I was watching him tie Atlantic salmon flies. But, you know, in the, on, on the Umqua in August, you just fished daybreak and you fished at dark. And the rest of the time it was 95 degrees and we're out there underneath the trees on a picnic table. And he's got all of these Atlantic salmon fly tying materials laid out. And he's sitting there cranking out these Atlantic salmon flies. And he said, someday I'm going to do a book and these flies will be in the book. Of course, they never were because he improved on his time substantially Hmm. by the time this salmon fly book came out six or five or six years later. Um, But I got, I got some good methods from him. Yeah. And then uh, watching Harry Darby tied me for, for Atlantic salmon flies and, they were beautiful, and I looked at that, and then I started collecting salmon flies from England, and that that just changed the shape of, you know, I quit I quit using wool or chenille, and it was mainly floss and seal for the bodies, and uh, nice hackles, you know, different shades of hackles that I dyed up, and polar bear for the wings, or hackle tips for the wings. And most always jungle cock. Mm-hmm. What about you? Ever put any uh, flash in your crystal flash or flash shabu in your flies? Um, if I do, it's mainly just like two strands. Yeah. Underneath the wing, um, there's a fly called the McNeese Madness. 
one of the few that I've ever named after me. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's got, um, uh, it's a really good fly for the Deschutes and oh, cool. it's got like four to, it's got like four to six strands of, of, uh, two strands of purple and four strands of, of crystal pearl pearlescent underneath the white and purple polar bear wing. Oh, wow. That's cool. What's the polar bear? What's the equivalent? Uh, you know, you can't get polar bear, but what, what's the closest thing we have to polar bear? Well, probably the, probably one of the better substitutes is, is the white hair on a skunk. Oh, on a skunk. Yeah. It's, it's real similar. It's real similar in texture and it's, it's still, you know, if you get a white one, it's still, uh, got, it still has the sparkle, but it's a, it's the texture. I bought a lot of Arctic fox tails years, years ago when I first opened my shop and it was nice on the fly, but the stuff collapses on the body. Just, there's no bounce to it. I mean, yeah. it doesn't, it just collapses. And it just kind of just a white halo. And back in those days, we couldn't dye it. You know, now now you can dye it because they've got colorful hair dyes that will penetrate that hard enamel on the oh yeah on the hair. Huh. So skunk, and can you get skunk uh, pretty easy without just you know is that available? Well, there's Moscow, there's Moscow um, furs in Idaho, and they usually have. Um, a dozen or twenty skunk skins there. There's other furriers that sell them. Yeah, you just you just have to look look up the different furriers and go down through the list. And, and um, I mean, there's a lot of things. You know, sometimes they have a damaged otter skin, and otter hair, of course, is one of the. It's probably the best dry fly material there is because of the density. Uh huh. And it's and the stuff's easy to bleach out. And then dye it different shades and mix the shades together. Because, mm-hmm. like I told people, I said insects aren't just cream. You know, there's a whole bunch of different colors there. So when I dye up a Mike Cahill stuff, I put in, you know, olives, a uh, little bit of orange, a little bit of pink, blues, um, along with a different shade of yellow, and then the cream, and blend it all up. <laughs> cool. Well, Dave, uh, we're going to get out of here pretty quick. This is um, this has been a great uh, conversation. I'm not sure, you know, I, I know we always leave stuff on the table here, but uh, before we get out of here, anything, um, you know, I guess a couple questions I have for you. One thing would be, we talked about a lot of stuff here from, you know, all the butterflies we never got into, but anything you're, you're kind of most proud of and, in, in, you know, things you've done kind of in the fly fishing and tying space? Well, I, um, you know, I was talking to Joe Rosano here, I, um, he's doing he's doing uh, some work on the book, okay. um, a chapter in the book, and uh, and Joe was saying, well, you know, your flies that you had in Trey Combs' book, and I said, you know, I wish that book would have come out a, a decade earlier when I was a better tire. <laughs> mm. um, you know, I think the flies were part of um, you know a big part of what people remember. Um, some of the anglers that bought my fly reels, um, that was, that was one of the, one of the more difficult challenges in my life to bring out a fly reel and, and, um, you know, it's a lot, that was a lot of hard work. Um, you know, buffing and uh, everything, everything on that, you know, I did that for 10 years and, and, uh, that was a lot of work, but, uh, you machined your own reels. Well, we had a CNC uh, set up, and they would program it. Um, most I, the first the first ones I did, um, but after that, I just I had my program, and I had these private. Um, I had this private man with his machine shop in his garage, and he did all the he did all the frames and spools and stuff for me. Mm, gotcha. And then I would go I would go pick them up. Um, I just didn't, I mean, there's, an, it's really hard to make any money when you're just doing one reel at, you know, making a reel at a time. You got to charge twice as much as my reels. Yeah. Because it takes so long, you know, the CNC just hmm. boom, 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 and they're, they're done. Hmm. 
how many reels of your of your reels are out there in the world? Uh, less than two thousand. Okay, wow, that's yeah, two thousand. Uh, that's most, quite a bit. There's there's not there's not very many in the United States. I sold I sold almost all the reels to Japan. No, oh, no, I kidding. only sold a couple of hundred. Yeah, I had a contract with a company over there from um, ninety four to 97 they wanted uh 60 reels every 45 days <clears throat> hmm. so i was cranking and right. that was long hours yeah you know i was still i was still building the um 10 or 15 rods a day and still doing materials and and uh, that's why in 1997 the economy in japan fell the guy decided um I could still sell the reels, but it, we do business differently in Japan. So he said, um, I'll take another 200 or three, I think it was 300 reels and then we're done. So I did those reels for him. And then that's why I uh, closed my warehouse and uh, went into the landscaping business was because of that. Hmm. Yep. And the fact that, it, you know, I had a, my wife had passed away and my daughter's now eight years old. I, yeah. you know, want to be with her more and more. And, and uh, going on. yeah. Well, uh, Dave, in the next, um, anything coming up for you, it sounds like the book in the next six to 12 months, any, anything new you want to give a shout out to? Well, I'm cranking. I'm, once I get out of this, my mother-in-law's house, which will be this month in August, I'm going to be home and writing. And, uh, I got, I got five new cane rods from, Steve Gobin over the last year, and I haven't even fished one of them, oh, so wow. I'm going to go fishing. <laughs> there you go. There you go. I talked, to him a, uh, I talked to him a couple of nights ago, and I said, it, it's really horrible. I just sit there and look at the rods on my bed, and I don't even go out. I don't have time to go out and fish. Wow. And it's it's really sad yep. that um, in June, it was probably the third week of June, I went up to my favorite pool on the McKenzie. And I've done this for a couple of years, and I go, where are all the bugs? There's no insects. And when I was a kid, there was tens of thousands of them, and there's nothing. Like caddis and stuff? I saw, yeah, there's nothing. No no little yellow stones, no, no little yellow mayflies. No, you know, mm. in June, everything's kind of a yellowish color. There was nothing. Maybe a couple of bugs. I saw one little trout jump. That's it. And, I, and last year, a woman walked up to me and I was sitting on the, sitting on the rock and she goes, boy, you look really sad. And I said, yeah, look at, there's no insects. Same time last year, different pool. Hmm. Something's happened. Yeah. I don't know what it is. Something's and it was changing. just like I took my kids, I took my kids down on a really expensive float trip, the four of us. And, um, we didn't catch one single fish. I didn't fish that much. I just wanted my kids to fish, and sure. they were casting their flies out there. We didn't get a single rise oh, the whole day. Oh, this is on the on the Mackenzie. Oh uh, yeah, on the Mackenzie. Wow, wow, and that can be that can be pretty hot in there, right? On uh, on dry Well, there's some places that are there. I I wish we could have fished. Um, <clears throat> we went up kind of high, and I wish we'd have fished a little bit further down. Um, uh, just east of Springfield and, and run run that water, but few few guides run that area. Oh, gotcha. And it's all wild trout. You know, the guides want to, they plant these hatchery fish in there. And the Helfrich boys, they had seven boats, 14 oh. people from Pendleton Woolen Mills. They didn't catch one fish. Huh. Yeah, the Helfrich, I've heard about those guys. Wow, well... Yeah. As always, Dave, there's a bunch of stuff I would I would have loved to get into, but I think this is a good start. I think officially this is the longest episode uh, of the podcast, so I think we've just uh, uh, broke the last record. Kelly Gallup, I believe, had the, the longest pre prior to this, so we did good there. Well, thanks for thanks for everything, and, and hopefully uh, there's some entertainment here. Yeah, no, I think it is. I mean, I think we we talked about the material dying, which for people that don't know about that, I think that's cool. Uh, Sid's history, we touched on that, and 
you know, just your history, right? You've been there since a long time and, and seen a lot. So I appreciate you coming on and sharing all your uh, knowledge and, and the history. And if people want to get in touch with you, they can just at, um, they can call you, right? 503-798-5790 if they have any questions for you. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. All right, Dave. Well, hey, thanks again. I'll, I'll let you know when this gets ready to roll, and uh, we'll look forward to uh, keeping in touch with you. Okay. Bye-bye. So there you go. If you want to find all of the show notes with all the links we covered, just go to wetflyswing.com slash 155. Thanks again for stopping by to check out the show today. I'm looking forward to catching up with you soon. I hope to maybe see you online or on the river. And uh, actually, before we get out of here, I'm going to leave you with that poem that I uh, talked about. So, um, so here you go. Light hits water in fractal flashes, math everywhere, ripples trail, line on surface tension, foliations like river sand. Try again, don't drop your tip. The continuity of casting, 10 to 2, the metrodome of oars, drifting now, discussing form, the way words shift and flash. Tips slow bend, fish, weeds more likely, check the fly. Taken by the wind, a cast pulled straight again, the rods parabolic. Keep tension, strip. Steady pressure, line through guides and fingers, arc of trout. You got it, you got it, raise the net. A tessellation of scales, pink, green, painting, wind through cattails plays discordant tones. Water drums the whole. Lower the lattice, weight, nudge, pause, pulse, gone.